Hello, and welcome to all of you for coming to, to speak to here, Seagal Sky. I'm going to keep the introductions very short because um, we all want to get Dr. Barakai's talk. Um, Dr. Baikari here is here as a postdoctoral fellow at the Israeli Institute um, of Israeli Studies here at Concordia University. But she has um, many roles in one. She is um, a curator and researcher of contemporary Israeli art. Since 2011, she has been the chief supervisor of art education in the Israel Ministry of Education uh, from 2013 to 17 onwards. She was chair of the Visual Literacy Arts Education Graduate Program and the Curatorial Studies Program at the Faculty of Arts at Kibbutzim College, Tel Aviv, Israel. I should just mention that as Chief Supervisor of Education, she invented a completely new, intensive, extensive art education program for elementary and high school students throughout Israel, which is really envious. We're really envious because it's so innovative and we should have it here as well. And she also invented the new Curatorial Studies program at Kibbutzim College. Um, her PhD dissertation named A Stage for Masculinities, Representations of Israeli Soldiers in a Theater, was submitted to the Faculty of the Arts at Tel Aviv University in 2012. And her book by that name is soon to be published at the Open University Press in Ramana, Raman, Ramana Israel. Uh, it's in Hebrew, but hopefully one day it will be translated into English. She curated exhibitions and published numerous, numerous papers on Israeli visual arts from a feminist and socio-political point of view. Her last article thus far is Historiographic Irony on Art, Nationality, and In Between Identity, which was published in 2016. Dr. Barkai is the winner of the 2010 Postdoctoral Fellowship here at Israeli, and here she's conducting research on as Israel-born raised artists in North America. I know that uh, this will be a phenomenal talk. Uh, I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Barkai uh, both last year at the International Conference on the census that took place here at Concordia and also at BAMP, at HUAC, where she talked about um, the concept of intimacy in the works of a contemporary Israeli artist. So, welcome. I should just mention that um, questions should all be at the end, and, and I will be orchestrating the, the question session. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here. I wanted to thank the Israeli School for the tremendous opportunity for me to be here in Concordia, and also the, the department, the art department here in the EV building who are hosting us today. So let's just dive in. Um, in recent decades, an expressive and innovative art form has evolved in the field of experimental video and film in Israel. Female artists such as Mia Pere, Maya Zap, and El Bartana are working in elaborate digital media which enables them to respond to political, cultural, and uh, personal issues. They use diverse technique, techniques and modes of expression, expression such as sophisticatedly edited documentary video, reflective, melancholic, and ironic mockumentary films, or grandiose and macabre cinematic fantasies. They re revisit and sometimes remake the stories of the Bible, or the myths associated with the Holy Temple, or the heavy shadow of the Holocaust hovering over Israeli existence on a daily basis. So we're going to get to know three of, three of those feminine, uh, female artists. The first one is uh, Maya Zak. Maya Zak is uh, looking inward, I, I just uh, put it this way, looking inward, digging the memory of, out of the query of the Jewish baggage and uh, trying to 
uh, establish her identity out of Judaism instead of Israelity. Uh, she's an artist fil filmmaker born in Israel, living and working in Tel Aviv. In 2016, Maya had exhibited Counterlight, an extensive solo show at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. This monumental film touches various points of Jewish-Israeli contemporary identity. The first generation of Israeli-born Sabra turned away from the diasporic Jewish uh, roots. Maya is doing the, the opposite. She delves into the query, and, I, and you'll soon say, uh, see why I, I'm repeating this uh, term, query, and digs out her current identity from the depth of the Jewish archive. So just <coughs> let's begin the movie. Well, of course, it's 23 minutes, so we're just going to see a few minutes uh, from different points of the film. Another stop, another point. 
Okay. So never mind. I'll, I'll explain uh, in, in, in the middle if you can find the, the film again. Um, the Zach exhibition, exhibition, a surreal, mental, and somewhat physical journey into the past memories, into the past memories, mind, and soul of Paul Celan, a very important Jewish uh, poet that writes about his own uh, experience in the, in the Holocaust. It's revolved around a central video piece, this video piece, and accompanied by an installation of sculptural elements, computer-generated images, and drawings. The artwork is about a female archiver who listens to extract, extracts from original recordings by Salan. The, the voice that we were hearing uh, talking in Yiddish, that's an original uh, documentary sound of uh, Salan himself. And um, while she changes from an archiv archivist into an alchemist. This film combines the figure of Selan's mother, the one who was projected uh, over there, and that's Selan's mother, uh, with the memories of the artist's uh, own mother who died young. Zap preserves the memory of the Jewish mother as an idealized, idealized heroine of the kitchen. Can we see the, the film again? Another. Uh, They just uh, put it in the middle, in the 15th moment. Or oh, the 8th, eight, the 8th eight moment, yeah. Let's see from there. Darf ich nein reden von was? This is, of course, original the archival material that she found, and now she's trying, she's beginning to manipulate it. So, back there is Salon itself. <laughs> Ich war offenbar hörbar, ich tippte euch zu. Okay, let's go to the 15th moment. Yeah. Ich bin es noch immer, ihr Schlaf, ja. That's it. Ich bin es noch immer, ihr So now she is in a fictitious uh, kitchen that she assembled out of memories of people that told her how it was looking. And uh, let's see what she's doing in the kitchen. Wait. 
scientific laboratory. She represents the mother in the rhetorical tools of the Enlightenment, idealized scientist in his laboratory, always a man. The self-importance, precision, and rigor of the scientist are copied and updated into the Jewish feminine kitchen. This is a commemoration ceremony to both Salan's mother and her own. So we'll go back to the presentation now. Um, yeah. Yes. So this is Paul Celan, and this is his most famous work, No One's Rose. It's, of course, a, a, a book of poems or poetry. The poetry of Jewish poet, poet Paul Celan provides insights into the horrors he experienced in the Nazi con concentration camps. The video's protagonist nurtures an obsess obsession for Salam, his life, his works, his women, and his exiles. This is a private adventure into the mind and spirit of Salam, who lived between 1920 and 1970, who is considered as one of the major poets of the modern and postmodern era. His work is at the heart of the discourse that ties together poetry, history, art theory, and metaphysics. I would only note that the most famous discourse around Salam is that he was a Jewish a person who went through concentration camps, but yet his mother tongue was German. So he only could really express himself in German. So he wrote all this uh, very, uh, very deep, very sensitive, very uh, emotional poems or uh, about being a, a, a Jewish uh, person in the concentration camp, and he wrote it in the 
language of the enemy. So this is something that uh, 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 always surrounds uh, this uh, discourse about language and what it means. So this is the vision. I, I must say that Maya Zak, uh, first and foremost, she is a drawing artist. She works with her pencil. The pencil is the, is the most direct, the most uh, uh, sensual way for her to, uh, to uh, vision uh, her, uh, her projects. And this is a drawing that she, that she did for the uh, installation in the museum. Of course, it's not really. This is not the real installation, but it gives us an idea of what she meant. Uh, on the left side, we have the archive, the woman uh, that is working on this table, this uh, big library, and, uh, and, and another thing that is flowing into the space, which is completely imaginative. And she also took the camera as a motif or as a, a symbol for giving witness, for, for being a witness. And she's sitting inside the camera. And it's kind of camera obscura. She's sitting inside the camera obscura. So she gives the, the woman slash mother slash archiver a very important role in preserving history and memory of the Holocaust. So just a, a little quote of the making of that she told me in a private interview. Uh, for whole weeks, only my hands, entire scenes that entered the movie. I didn't know that, that they would be there. I was, it was not planned ahead. It is film shooting that comes from visual material connections, the central flesh of the film. So all that we saw inside the, movie, the, the film, the hands that are working with the doll, the hands that are cutting, the hands that are uh, drawing, it's her way to, uh, to make the, the art of filmmaking into something much more sculptural, much, much more material uh, than just a film or just a documentary or just a narrative. So this is the installation view in the Telephone Museum. And we can see here, oh, I have this one. Uh -huh. We can see here, this is the entrance with this, this huge library with boxes like the archive. And then you go into a screening space. And then you go from this screening space to two more screening space through this camera, like the blower, that is kind of a camera also. And the sketches that she made became part of the exhibition too. And also, we are we're taking the uh, material uh, uh, objects that she worked on in the film, and we see it as real things in space. OK. So let's just finalize Maya. Maya and Jewish resources. She, she, said, she said to me, maybe. It, it all has to do with my family. My father's and my mother's parents all left families in Eastern and Central Europe, families that disappeared during the Holocaust. Suddenly I realized that my family and Sedans came from the same neighborhood. The question of belonging to the Jewish people for me was not taken for granted, partly because my parental grandmother was from a Catholic and Indian family and she herself was born in a coffee plantation in the Ants. I understand now that family connections are very significant and that the missing ones created a kind of existential pit. So she's obliged to work with the memory of the Jewish people as an Israeli and to try to revive it through the archive of the Jewish memory of Holocaust. And I will finalize this uh, part by, by quoting another thing that she told me. 
I was always interested in Jewish history, <coughs> the Jewish situation, Jewish faith. Through Paul Salam, I also came to know other sources in Jewish culture. I was exposed to Gershom Sholem, his writing, and Kabbalah. It was surprising and exciting. Ideas I have found about language and space, a text that seems to be postmodern, is actually antique. It is important for me to approach and rewire Jewish materials and sources that were abandoned by us, the secular people that live in Israel, following our antagonism to the rabbinical establishment in Israel. We handed over these sources to those who claim to be real Jews and have, have been left without roots. I would be happy to find a new taste and meaning for Israeliness, the present and the future, out of this cultural wealth that is available to us if we only desire it. So the strategy of Maya Zak is looking inward, digging the memory out of the query of the Jewish baggage. This is her way of coping as a contemporary Israeli Jew. She turns a blind eye to another uh, to other identities in the Israeli space and avoids issues related to the conflict. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to go to the other uh, artist I'm going to talk about today, which is Mila Kirai. And this is a completely different approach. She is a political artist. She defines herself as a political artist. In her works, she uses documentary film tactics in order to expose abnormalities created because of the state religion state, status quo. I have to explain now that in Israel, the status quo between state and religion is different from in, uh, the one in North America, which separates state, state and church. In Israel, because it's the only Jewish state in the world, uh, there is a lot of mingling and a lot of uh, rules dictated even to secular people. For example, we cannot have public transportation during our holy day, uh, during our holy day, Shabbat. We can, if someone doesn't have a car, even if he doesn't believe in Shabbat, even if he, he or her uh, is completely secular, we cannot go to the beach or go to the cinema because we don't have transportation, okay? So uh, this came out of a letter sent by the Vision Guyon in 1947 to the ultra orthodoxy uh, Abu Dhabi Israel organization. Ben Guyon addressed issues of Shabbat, of Jewish dietary laws, the kosher laws, education, marriage, and divorce. Just for example, if I want to marry and I'm a secular person, I must go through rabbinical administration. Or uh, if I work in the Ministry of Education, which is formal a, a institution of the State of Israel, I cannot eat food which is not kosher. I must eat kosher food. So in practice, uh, this letter laid the foundation for the relationship <coughs> between religion and the State of Israel, in other words, the so-called status quo. Nia says that the, the frame, the Jewish state, it has an inner contradiction inside itself. So, let's see now. Uh, I'll go back. Uh, Nia believes in a state for all its citizens and does not identify with the Jewish state. This is a very radical and unpopular stance in the Israeli society. She's influenced by the scholarship of Ishayao Leibovich, who believed that state and religion must be separated completely to avoid corrupting each other. She says, if the state is an instrument or an engine, then the status quo is the essence of this engine. This union between territory, religion, and domination is tragic in my eyes. It is in the essence of the Israeli pathology. Okay, she, she said it to me in a private interview. She chooses her, uh, her uh, art practice as a, as a documentary filmmaker who is 
uh, not showing documentary films, but art that she manipulates or, uh, or edits, edits in a way that it, it expresses her uh, political view or agenda. <coughs> so she's looking for these cracks in, the, in reality. Third is looking for human behavior pattern, patterns that are manifested in the architectural space in order to reveal hidden personal, political, and religious agendas. Public, public spaces of religious or political or military importance serves to show symptoms of the problematic everyday existence in the Israeli-Palestinian land. Those cracks in reality are exposed in esoteric events which testify to a much greater social significance, such as the event depicted in the video before us. Before we see the video, I just want to say, this is the mosque on Temple Mount, and this is a, a reconstruction from the scriptures, a model of the Jewish temple. We're going to speak about it later, so I don't want to expand right right now, but just look at this. Um, when, she's, when I'm saying that she's looking for cracks in reality, some people think that this is really existent. This really exists, but this is only fantasy. This is what, what really exists in real life in Israel, okay? So in her quest for cracks in reality, she comes to uh, the, um, the cave of the Patriarch, Me'arat HaMachpela, in Hebron, the double tomb uh, of Abraham and Sarah, the, ma uh, mother, the mothers and fathers, the ma matriarchs and patriarchs of the Jewish uh, nation. And she is shooting this film over there. Let's see. So it's back to back, it's two videos, each of them four minutes, ten seconds. Let's see the first one. No? Just, what is it? Just push. Yeah, and here. It says, says there, this is the tomb of our father Abraham.
this is the first one. And we're going to see the other one, Sarah. This is Abraham Abraham. And we're going to see Sarah Sarah. Yes. Go back to the yeah. To the link up there. Yeah. Okay, and then down there. Scroll down. Mm -hmm. the second one? Yeah. Double projection video installation for a minute ten, 10 seconds each. It was shot at the cave of the patriarchs in the one in the West Bank. The work documents an old ceremony in which the holy site exchanges hands uh, back and forth between Arabs and Jews during the exception procedure. In Perth's work, this ritual 
re reveals the way political sovereignty and religious rights create an anomalous reality. And she says, I'm engaged in the prevention, in the preservation of contemporary perspective on Jewish life in Israel in the sense of interaction, perhaps very surreal, between something that might have been relevant 2,000 years ago and the desperate attempts to relive it today. So just a small explanation about what we just saw. The cave of the patriarchs, Haram el is located in the heart of the old city of Hebron, Al Khalil. In the holy books of the Torah, Bible, and Quran, the cave was purchased by Abraham as a burial plot from him, for him and Sarah. The cave is located beneath a Saladin era mosque, which had been converted from a large rectangular Herodian uh, Judean structure. Dating back over 2,000 years ago, the monumental Herodian compound is believed to be the oldest intact in prayer structure in the world that still fulfills its original function. The Hebrew name of the complex reflects the tradition of the double tombs of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah, considered the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Jewish people who are buried there. Ibrahim, Abraham, is considered the father of both Jews and Muslims, father of Isaac and Ishmael. So these are pictures that I took from sites, from two different sites. As you see, it's the same hole with this green walls. This is a Muslim site, and this is a Jewish site. And each of them is showing only Muslims here and only Jews here. So the uh, exception possible, or Khalid, as we call it in Hebrew, is a, is a procedure that enables uh, the Jews to get in to the big hall uh, and pray in, in, uh, in their separate days, and vice versa. <coughs> Farah jo chose this uh, space because, in her words, it is, it is a spatial architectural manifestation of the state religion status quo. In the past, the cave was open to all believers of all faith all year long. This had changed and physically divided for separate use since the Bauch Wolstein massacre in 1994. This was a shooting carried out by an Israeli Jewish settler, Dr. Bauch Wolstein. Wolstein opened fire on Muslim worshippers. He killed 29 people and 125 were wounded. Wolstein was widely denounced in Israel and by communities in the Jewish diaspora. Since then, the current status quo in the cave of the patriarchs is 80% of the cave's area is a mosque and 20% is a synagogue. Most of the year, the small holes, Abraham and Jacob, are open to the Jews and the great hall, Isaac Hall, is open to Muslims. There are about 10 days a year, especially on holidays, where the cave is only open to Jewish worshippers and about 10 days in which the cave is open to Muslims only. The space is organized and managed by the State of Israel, hence the army and police forces. So, what are the artistic strategies that uh, Nira is uh, taking uh, in order to enhance her political stand and to say what she means? First of all, she insists on documentary uh, footage. She goes there. It's a big deal to get uh, uh, permission to get inside the cave uh, as a Jew to film the Muslims and uh, to interrupt the work, everyday work of the army and the police. But she manages to do that. She goes through a lot of trouble to do that because she wants the, the work to be based on documentary footage. Then she goes back to the studio. And as you've seen, as, as you've seen she uh, edits the material in a very subtle and intricate uh, uh, way. And she also enhances the, uh, the meaning by the sound. 
She uses a, a method called Foley, Foley or Foley, Foley, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, uh, which is done in the studio. Uh, she only uh, puts in sounds that are meaningful, for example, the squeakings of the doors, the dangling, dingling of the keys. And this is a way to put, uh, put a, even enhance the meaning that she wants in, into the video. And the third thing is the installations. She only shows this work in, in values of art. She doesn't show it as a film in the television, for example, but it's only in art spaces, uh, museums, galleries. Uh, the editing and the installation in space emphasize her political saying. She creates non-documentary non aesthetics, as, as, as I see it. She employs multi-channel works that sterilize the events and estrange them from their realistic, everyday documentary origin. This aesthetic intervention heightens an, a contrast, a constant discomfort with political state of events. She, she stresses immense importance to the installation of the artwork in space, using space to manipulate the audience uh, behavior in the, in, into a performance of its own right. She also enhanced everyday sound effects in the studio in order to amplify the meaning. Okay, let's see, uh, let's summarize her political uh, strategy, strategies. So the presentation in space forces the audience to make a bodily physical choice. In order to watch one side, you must ignore the other. The choice of the audience in space is a metaphor, of course. In order to survive, you have to choose sides. You must ignore, turn your back, not see the other, Perak said to me. The artist is an observing witness. She sees her role not as an activist, but as someone who elevates the consciousness to the absurdity of the state of events. She protests against the Palestinian narrative being ignored not mentioned in the Israeli educational system or even in everyday conversations. Her motivation is educational. By showing the so-called symmetry of events, she exposes in her eyes the unsymmetrical and unjust situation. The soldier behavior is neutral to both sides, but still it is the Israeli army that manages the space. Oh, not so similar. So let's uh, finish uh, the part of Nina by her own words. It's terribly, terribly ridiculous. It's sad for me that it is sad for them that they are not willing to share this beauty that lies within their hand, hands. To me, since I'm an absolute athlete, what always prevented me from being religious is the lack of understanding of the universality of the spiritual position. Mm -hmm. After all, there is only one God. So how is it possible that these believe in that, this and those believe in that? This position, position is ridiculous to me. It confuses all of God's commands. The, so this Israeli artist is anti-occupation and anti-militaristic. She holds a universal humanistic position, saying it's her obligation as an Israeli Jew to fight against the wrongs of the occupation and to educate Israelis about the Palestinian narrative. She chooses to live and work in Israel precisely because this gives her a permission to criticize her own society. She's doing it, she's doing so from the heart of the conflict, the city of Hebron and the state of Israel. So this is Nina. I wanted just to, just as a short comment. Canada, a different suggestion. Uh, here in Ontario, when a, when a mosque was firebombed as part of a wave of, of uh, hate crimes, uh, a Canadian synagogue invited the Muslims to pray there. And uh, I quote, the Beth Israel Synagogue in Peterborough, Central Ontario, invited Muslims, uh, Muslim worshippers to the Majid, Majid al-Salam Mosque 
to pray in their building after it had been firebombed. Bet Israel Synagogue President Larry Gilman told CBS, as Canadians, we have to stick together. It's not about religion, it's about race. Canadians do that. <laughs> so Kenzo Abdella, the president of Kawa Kawarta Muslim Religion Association, told CBC, they walked to the mosque and told us that whatever we need, they would support us. Even though it came out of a tragedy, we are working together. So this is a completely different suggestion from Kabon. In Kabon, they want to stand on the head of one another, and also in the uh, Temple Mount, they want to stand on the head of one another, not together. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the words of the uh, Muslim uh, uh, Kenzo Abdella, and he says, we have more similarities than differences. We have so much in common. The details of worship and the ceremonies. Even the stories we hear are similar. At the, at the end of the day, it's a house of God. Okay, just a minute. Yeah. Okay. So that summarizes this part. And we're going to the last artist that we are going to see today. This is Yael Bartana, and I'm going to jump, jump right into the film, and then we'll talk about it. Her name? Yeah, see it down there.
forward a little bit. That was the first part, but we must see the, the last part because it's very significant. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, so this is, they're falling into hell. But I just wanted to show you something there. It's a long way work. showing us the construction and destruction of the third temple. Uh, the starting point of Inferno is the construction of the third temple of Salomon, Templo de Salmao, in Sao Paulo by the Brazilian Neo-Pentecostal Church. This is a real building. This is not a fantasy. The real uh, church built the exact replica of the Holy Temple in Brazil, São Paulo. Yeah. Built to biblical specifications, <coughs> this new temple is a replica of the first temple in Jerusalem, which the, the violent destruction of, uh, of the, this temple signaled the diaspora of the Jewish people in the sixth century BC. Bartana's film employs a methodology that commingles fact and fiction, prophecy, prophecy and history. Her work addresses the grandiose temple project while deliberately blurring the boundaries between the histories of antiquity in the Middle East with a surreal Christian ritual unfolding half away around the world in Sao Paulo, Brazil today. This deliberate blurring between past and present, myth and, and reality, reveals, according to Batana, the fiction hidden within any religious political or personal agenda. Every story that we tell ourselves about the meaning of our existence is considered by the artist as an immediate suspect and is doomed to failure, destruction, and reincarnation as a consumer product. Uh, in the end of the movie, we see a, a young guy selling t-shirts and of the temple and menorahs and all kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's transformed in a cons into a cons consumer product wrapped in the aura of kitsch sentimentality. Her queer eye, as you see in the, the, the high priest, is, is a queer figure very known in Brazil. Uh, her queer eye 
informed in the writings of Michel Foucault and Judy Butler, sees every dimension of, the human, of human behavior as a performance that is suspicious of being socially constructed and therefore fictitious. Um, so this is the real, uh, uh, this is the opening. When she was there, she was in a commission, and she got a commission to stay in uh, Sao Paulo and do her research there, and it was 12-13. Uh, and in 12-14, the real uh, uh, temple, holy temple, which is actually a church, was opened in a huge ceremony in uh, San Paolo. This one who's look, who looks like a rabbi is actually a pastor. And those young people are Christians. But you can see that the priests are dressed like Levim, like the, the priests of Holy Temple in the Bible. And uh, the people who are praying, they believe that there is the Old Testament and the New Testament and it's all part of Christianity now. It's called the Universal Church, and it embraces both sides. So this is a complete replica of the Jewish ceremony, but it's completely Christian. Another thing I wanted to show you was the Francisco Hayes destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem from 1867, which is a romantic uh, painting that inspired Baltana in her, uh, the, uh, the way she directed the scenes of the uh, Armageddon, uh, the Doom Day. The aesthetic of the film, the aesthetics of the film, inspired by the writings of French philosopher Jacques Rancière about the politics of aesthetics, burst into the phantasmagoric grandiose and full of pathos spectacle. Using digital manipulation turns the event into a science fiction Armageddon. The film offers a messianic ritual, a messianic ritual contaminated by a dark and ironic prophecy regarding the fate of any attempt to rebuild the Third Temple. So what is so cr uh, crushing there, it's only a digital um, um, work, a, a digital uh, uh, media manipulation, it's not true. What is, what is true is that, uh, is that uh, she really saw uh, the construction, she took uh, f uh, uh, pictures of the site, and then she put the, uh, the uh, holy temple there before even it was finished, and then she destructed it. So her idea of building temples is that it, one day it's going to, to fall apart anyway, and it will, it's all a big circle that will end in another wailing wall and so on and so forth. She says, I do not make movies. I use the tool of cinema to make art. This is very different. Narratives not according to the schematic conventions. I'm very interested in creating social experiments through cinema, changing reality and seeing what happens. I am a documentary filmmaker of a fictive reality. Um, so I think we can now go to, oh, I'm late, in, uh, 20 minutes late, right? There's a class coming. So we have to go to question, uh, just small questions, if it's okay. Thank you very much. Someone? Response? Questions? Question? Question? No, that's, that's, that, these are actors? Yeah. That she recruited? Yeah. And this is all staged, of yeah. course. This is yeah. from her own imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She took, uh, actually, she took uh, Brazilian actors and models, and she replaced them with the old uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jew, uh, Jewish uh, tradition. More? Other questions? Yeah. 
Oh, you're not going to Carol, come with me? Carol. <laughs> I feel like we over here. I should point out that she's standing in front of a Christian cathedral. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> here in, in Europe. Yes. 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 You know. Um, well, thank you for a really fantastically interesting uh, uh, presentation of these three artists. I know Bartan, I didn't know the others. Um, I'm struck by the sense of ceremony uh, that pervades their, the, all three of their work. So I wonder if you could talk about the use of the ceremonial as an art form. Um, I don't know if it has a particular significance for you as a cultural uh, yeah. mode. You know, yeah. um, if it's feminist, but um, all three are involved in making, uh, in using the notion of ritual. Yeah, I, I, I will, in, in an answer, I'll go to my summary, which I forgot. <laughs> Three contemporary Israeli female artists belonging to the same generation who matured as artists in the 1990s. In Israel, it was a time of the great disillusionment from the peace dream embodied in the assassination of Prime Minister Tzhak Rabin. All three of them relate to contemporary Israel and to Judaism in an ambivalent, complex, and critical manner. However, each of them have developed different strategy for dialogue with her a Jewish-Israeli identity. Just a minute. I have to read it to you. Maya Zak embraces the Jewish heritage as a legacy of ancient wisdom belonging to all Jews, secular and religious alike. She turns a blind eye to the conflict. Mia Perg harshly criticizes the political situation in Israel but prefers to do it while living in Israel. She takes an educational stance hoping that to change political awareness from within. She's against the linkage of religion, religion and state and hopes for intercultural relations between the Semitic people living in Israel and Palestine. Yaelpa Bautana is a post-Zionist, but in her words, you have to first be a Zionist to become a post-Zionist. She cares deeply for Israel, but cannot see her future there, and she is pessimistic about the future. She gave up nationality altogether and dismisses religion and national symbols as fictitious. So I'm not forgetting, I'm just saying that this is, a, this is a ceremony. These are what we call the use of candles. The use of candles, it's a, it's a, a, a certain generation in, in Israel that in 1995, in one minute, when Prime Minister uh, Rabin uh, went down, clashes all, all the dreams, all the expectations, I was a high school teacher at that time. And my students, they were 15 or 16 years of, of age, they couldn't stop weeping for a whole week. They went every day to Rabin's uh, 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 square, put, the, put on their own ceremonies, which is, these are, these are uh, candles, uh, soul candles, Jewish soul candles. So they did all kinds of uh, rituals, for themselves, and it was like the burial of the Zionist ritual. Uh -huh. And since then, they are looking for other rituals to, to hold on to, because they lost their own sense of being or, 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 or a dream for, for a potential good future. And at least two of them, Nila and Yael, left Israel at that time, in the 90s. Nila left Israel in the age of 18 before going to the army. She completely dissected herself from the Israeli society. She went to New York for 10 years. And uh, it, she says that it, it was because in one second, she realized that there are two narratives. And she realized that her all, uh, the whole uh, narrative that she grew up with of the Jewish people and how, how just it is for them to live in Israel, suddenly in one day she went to the Arab market in, in the old Jerusalem and she saw a map. And every place where there was a Jewish-Israeli uh, uh, settlement or, or place or town or whatever, there was an Arab name. 
So she suddenly said to herself, I was raised on a lie. And she couldn't stand it anymore. So she went uh, uh, for 10 years to New York. But then she came back because she wanted to educate Israeli Zionist Jewish minds to think, at least to acknowledge that there is another narrative. Yael Batana also said to me that she, she felt after the murder of Rabin that she has got to go out of Israel. And all, all her uh, criticism uh, about the society, came, uh, she began it when she was in, in New York, when she saw it from uh, far away. Because she was growing in a moshav, in uh, Emek Israel, in a very, very hegemonic and very established uh, place. And she was educated that we are right, we are always right. And suddenly, after a being, she saw that something went wrong there. So the, all three of them, they are in their 40s now, and they belong to a certain uh, generation that ask questions about uh, about Jewish uh, state, about the, the way we establish this dynastic uh, uh, administration in, in Israel and so on and so forth. Yeah. Oh, I just thought, I have a very interesting work. I thought for sure that the uh, first is Maya Zak, which has the same first name as thought of like, I'm seeing like a, a remake of Maya Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon. I mean, I thought that the other film inhabits this first film that you have. And uh, in a way, in a certain way. Yeah. And I think she's definitely inspired by it. I mean, I think if you ask her, she'll talk about it. And uh, the second that would all three artists, uh, do you say, would all three artists agree with the idea that the fragmentation of identity is also the construction of identity? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah, uh, so. they are all very critical, they are all very uh, uh, thoughtful, they are looking at, uh, on the society with um, sober gaze, okay, not trying to idealize it. Like the big notion of fragmentation, do you see the notion of fragmentation? Yeah, that is the crush, that is the, uh, the fragmentation. They were crushed from within, they, they, their whole world were uh, going apart. So the fragmentation came into their over if they wanted it or not. Dana, you have a question? No, I do. You don't? <laughs> Another question here? Martha. I have uh, sorry. Um, I was also struck by the, I mean, it goes along with the ceremonial aspect. I was really struck by the um, uh, controlled aspect of all of these works. Mm -hmm. They're very, they're very deliberate in the first instance. and. Um, and I don't know. I could use it. I could use the cinnamon all the way through. But um, the place where I found it puzzling as a strategy was was in the work um, of uh, Perig. I thought the foley, which hit me immediately, was um, so hyper controlled mm -hmm. and so yeah. exclusive uh, within a documentary vein of the actual sound of the bodies that she could have exploited um, within those works, where you'd actually have some more phys physicality of the, of the figures and their movements and so forth. I mean, the little guys who are moving things are clearly laughing at one point, and they feel very awkward and strange in front of the camera. And I just wondered why she controlled it so severely, what your I feeling think, is about I think that. I think I'll only give you, can give you my answer. I think that when you have a very political agenda as an artist, you have to cut in the sides. You have to go directly, and you have to control every aspect, because you have a clear message to, to, to give. And, and I think she's, in, she's a bit, I don't know, She's a bit forceful in her way to 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 bring the message on. She she doesn't want anything to to disturb it. That's what you I didn't hear the first term that you used that brought this issue up. Can you repeat it? I didn't hear. Foley. She's using foley, which means which means that she's. Um, 
if, if there's a sound that she wants to bring out, it's it's fictionalized in studio from... Is that a filming term? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's either sync sound, well, let me say either or. Yeah. The sync sound is what you would expect from the movement of bodies in the space and so right. forth. So that's she what we think of as a naturalized cinematic she, experience. She yeah. cleans other noise and she only uh, concentrates on the noise that she wants to, right. to put yeah. in. Okay. So a window would open, you hear the sash. I, my interpretation of that was a necessary sterility. She's abstracting the human aspect of this transaction, and I think to do that, you cannot have that sound because that's human and that evokes feeling. And she's trying to show something I think that was separate from that, and so I saw that as kind of an important aspect of what she's representing. I, I, I agree, and I think I think more of that. She wanted that when I talked to her, she said. What she wanted really to show there was the action of the soldiers, where almost yes. they were almost hidden, but they orchestrated the whole ceremony. And she wanted uh, the audience to see how it's the same and not the same at the same time. So she didn't uh, concentrate on the human aspect of this ceremony, but yet I, uh, okay, well, we have to go, <laughs> uh, but I think that the, the most moving part of this uh, film is the faces of the Muslims and the faces of the Jews. When, in the minute they came, they came into the space. Okay, it's the Menorah Machpelah. It's the it's the most sacred place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and they are coming in Yom Kippur or Ramadan. They are coming in and they are shining. So, even though she didn't want to speak about it, she kind of did. Uh, um, expose the real feeling uh, of the of the worshippers, both the Muslims and the Jews. We have time for one more question. Okay. No question. It's not a question, it's just a comment. To me, it was an amazing, amazing presentation. Still, there is no solution. Going no to solution. America, <laughs> you're just putting the blinds on the indigenous people and who the country belongs to and so on. So it's a question of what you see, and there's no, no way out. Yeah, and the, the, one of the things that, that uh, uh, made me much smarter by coming here to Canada is to realize that there is no neutral space, and in every country there are problems, indigenous or others, and every, every place has its own political uh, um, controversies. And but the very young people who are born in this new place, and they don't know anything else. They don't have another past. So, so this is the real... The yeah, Anne told me something. She told me that people are always angry with her because she doesn't give any answers. <laughs> but there are no answers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.